So, hello, and welcome to episode two of Sect Ed. That's S E C T S Ed. And I'm Patrick Reynolds. And I'm Michael Albany. So, today we're going to be telling a very sad story about a group that's close to my heart, and that is the Cathars. While our first episode had violent clashes between a religious minority and the larger society that they belong to, and an assassination, we're going to give you a heads up that this story has violence on a much larger scale. So, to start things off, who were the Cathars? Uh, they're a group of religious communities who lived in mostly southern France, and the events we're going to be talking about today are mostly in the Middle Ages, around the 1200s AD. But Catharism is a religion whose roots can be traced back almost to the very start of Christianity. They were a part of a revival of Gnostic Christian traditions, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Gnosticism, we'll start by giving a brief overview, because Gnosticism is a huge and diverse branch of Christianity that lots of modern listeners might not be familiar with. Um, now, we don't mean agnostic, which uh, that's a completely different thing. Uh, gnosis, with a silent G, is an ancient Greek word meaning knowledge, uh, with connotations of secret knowledge or spiritual knowledge, uh, specifically also knowledge of God. So agnostic translates from the Greek to meaning without knowledge of God, but uh, Gnostic faiths like the Cathars are pretty much the opposite. They believe that knowledge of God is possible and that um, it's the personal search for knowledge, uh, the secret kind of knowledge that's important um, and important enough that they are named after it. So going back to the early history of the Christian church, uh, and I'm talking back to when it was the official religion of the Roman Empire, Gnostic versions of Christianity were labeled heretics, and that's heretics with a capital H, uh, by Orthodox and Catholic churches, and there were a lot of efforts to counter their influence. For a long time, the only sources we had access to about Gnosticism were written by their enemies. These are officials in the Catholic and Orthodox churches who wrote very long and very specific denunciations, saying that Gnostics teach about this and that, and they're all wrong and they're actually devil worshippers. That was essentially the connotations of their writings. In the 1940s, however, ancient caches of religious writings were discovered in the Middle East, translated, and revealed to be writings by the Gnostics themselves. So we have access to a lot of exciting insights into this major branch of Christianity. Actually, one of the big uh, writers who talks a lot about Gnosticism is St. Augustine, who in his younger days lists that as a... Uh... He's followed some Gnostic creeds in his younger days and then uh, denounces them. So what are the things that set Gnostics apart from other Christians? Well, they had a lot of the same stories and myths from the Old Testaments of the Bible, but in most cases they took the exact opposite lessons from those stories, and it's fascinating. Uh, I've heard it described in a couple places as mainstream Christianity reflected in the mirror where everything is flipped. Um, they believe that the God that Jesus preached about in the New Testament, the one that's all you know, love and forgiveness and mercy and turning the other cheek, um, they believe that that God is a separate, distinct entity from the Old Testament God who was fighting people and killing firstborns and demanding to be worshipped. Uh, and Gnostics tend to believe that these two different entities are in some way opposed to each other. Um, so to Gnostics, and by extension the Cathars who sprang out of Gnosticism, um, the God who created the heavens and the earth is the enemy. It's the source of all evil, uh, and specifically the evil is ignorance. And they call this Old Testament creator God the Demiurge, or a bunch of other names depending on the specific group. But the core attributes of this entity is that it was both arrogant and evil. Um, so they view the creator figure uh, and all material things, everything that's of the earth, uh, all of our things that exist that are not spiritual as uh, corrupt and evil. So the true God to the Gnostics is a totally spiritual one with no physical form, and it is this God that um, the human souls come from and are trying to return to. And so in the Gnostic worldview, humans are pure minds and souls trapped in physical bodies in this world of misery with an evil deity as our jailer. But then through knowledge, wisdom, kindness, and by following the teachings of Jesus Christ and the gospel specifically, we can free ourselves. And another major thing that uh, sets them apart from other branches of Christianity, since they believe that all material things are sinful and bodies specifically are sinful to have, um, they don't believe that Jesus Christ had one. They believe that he was a purely spiritual, non-physical entity. Um, which conflicts pretty directly with the crucifixion. They're not really into that, which uh, you can you can sort of tell um, the conflicts between this and specifically the Catholics, which will come later. Um, there's, there's very, very big uh, breaches in their religious tradition. So then who were the Cathars specifically? Uh, they were one of the many revivals of Gnostic tradition that crop up here and there throughout history, uh, and this time in Languedoc, uh, the region of southern France in the Middle Ages. Uh, there isn't one particular founder, and it's hard to nail down exactly when they emerged in the region, 
uh, but it was supposedly spread by wandering holy men with vows of poverty who opposed the Catholic Church and eventually came to embrace Gnostic beliefs. So they were also known as the dualist heresy and the two principles. Uh, there are reports of Cathars going back to the 8th century, but for the most part we're going to be talking about uh, Cathars in the 12th and 13th centuries of the Common Era, uh, when they were firmly established in this region. The name Cathar means pure, but members of this sect uh, tended to call themselves good men, or more commonly they just called themselves Christians. And they were also uh, called Albigensians, mostly by their enemies, since a lot of Cathars lived in the town of Albi, uh, which is what the uh, eventual crusade is going to be named after, the Albigensian Crusade. One of the biggest rights that needs to be understood to understand the Cathars is the right of consolamentum. And this right is how a person went from just a regular Cathar to being one of their religious leaders. What the consolamentum really resembles is a kind of a baptism uh, that removes all the sins that one's committed in life. So people who had gone through the rite of consolamentum were called perfects, which were the leaders of the Cathar religious community. Uh, and an interesting thing about the ritual of consolamentum is that it was available to both men and women, and women were accepted as religious leaders on equal terms with men. Uh, this is because in the Cathar view, since our bodies are just prisons keeping our pure souls trapped in this evil physical world, uh, the sex that the body had was considered irrelevant. It was considered irrelevant only in spiritual terms, though, which is uh, fine for the perfects because spiritual matters are all they are supposed to be concerned with. Uh, so while uh, we think it's great that they had some women respected as leaders of the communities, we definitely shouldn't think of them uh, like they're modern feminists transported back in time. But yeah, essentially they viewed it as like um, when you became a perfect, you were giving up your gender. Sure. You were like, you were sexless. But if you hadn't done that, their gender roles were the same as, as everybody around them. So there are a few other aspects of the rite of consolamentum and uh, how perfects worked that are important to mention. Uh, generally, you needed to study a lot before you could undergo this rite, usually for a year or more with another perfect guiding you through it and helping you out. And once your sins were forgiven and you became a perfect, you were not allowed to commit any sin ever again, and you had to maintain your sinless state for the rest of your life. Uh, for this reason, the Cathar perfects would always travel in groups of at least two so they could keep an eye on each other, which seems really stressful to me, but also great, because if you were a Cathar perfect, you'd always have at least one friend. So what happens if you sinned anyway? Uh, your status as a perfect was just stripped away, so the ones who couldn't handle the uh, incredibly high standards would wash out pretty quickly uh, the first time they gave in to sin. There was also another version of the consolamentum which was performed on someone uh, when they were on their deathbed. Normally, the consolamentum was done to wash away sins of a person and turn them into a religious leader for their community. But if one of the non-perfect Cathars was dying and they knew that their time was short, they could use their once-in-a-lifetime chance at essentially the last minute, washing away all their sins and being forgiven uh, right at a point when they were too sick to commit any new sins. Uh, luckily, the Cathars also believed in reincarnation. So all those who never went through consolamentum at all, uh, or those who went through it and lost their perfect state afterwards, uh, could get another chance in a next life. Given the huge differences between Catholics and Cathars, uh, the crusade that's eventually going to happen can seem inevitable. Uh, but what's important to note is that they lived in peace with each other for a very long time, at least a few hundred years. One of the biggest factors for how the Cathars were accepted for so long, in spite of the religious differences, really comes down to the fact that their Catholic neighbors often really respected the way that pious Cathars lived their lives. Since becoming a Cathar perfect was so difficult, and all it took was one sin to lose that status, Cathar perfects who stuck it out tended to be people who took their religion very seriously and lived by extreme uh, strict moral codes which include owning no possessions, committing no acts of violence, abstaining totally from sex, avoiding excess in food or drink, sticking to a vegetarian diet, and focusing entirely on spiritual contemplation and caring for their followers and communities. So the way that a pious Cathar behaved actually really closely resembled the ideal of how a pious Catholic was supposed to behave. Uh, and even more damning, the officials of the Catholic Church at the time in the area were preaching about poverty and chastity too, and then not living up to that kind of lifestyle, while the pious Cathars clearly were. The following is a quote from a long doc Catholic about the Cathars, and there's a lot of quotes like this uh, that sum up how their Catholic neighbors thought about them. The Gospels were their guide for conduct. Their celibacy, their austerities, were those of the monastic ideal. Their criticism of the Orthodox clergy was hardly more severe than that characteristic of other Puritans and Reformers. Their disdain for the material world was rivaled by that of anchorites, 
whose sanctity was revered by the church. There were always propaganda campaigns coming out of Rome against the Cathars, and they were accused of devil worship, sodomy, uh, fornication, cannibalism, incest, basically uh, every over-the-top evil thing that uh, was the standard propaganda of the time. A Catholic friar from Milan wrote a response to these accusations, saying of the Cathars, quote, they are, however, most chaste of the body, for men and women observing the vow and way of life of this sect are in no way soiled by the corruption of debauchery. Actually, the rumor of the fornication, which is said to prevail among them, is most false, for it is true that once a month, either by day or by night, in order to avoid gossip by the people, men and women meet together, not, as some lyingly say, for the purpose of fornication, but so that they may hear preaching and make confession to their preaching official. They are wrongfully wounded in popular rumor by the many malicious charges of blasphemy from those who say they commit many shameful and horrid acts of which they are innocent, end quote. There's a lot of, yeah, I've had a lot of quotes uh, from people who never met a Cathar saying that they were demon worshippers, and then basically all the quotes from people who had were like, these are all completely lies. <laughs> um, Anyway, so the two biggest things that I really like about the Cathar story uh, was the acceptance of women as the equals of men, even though they only meant spiritually. Uh, and also I like the long history of religious tolerance and interfaith cooperation that was going on. But unfortunately, this story does not have a happy ending at all. So let's move on to the single most important event in the history of Catharism, the Albigensian Crusade. So I'm going to give uh, a very brief overview of what the political situation in Languedoc looked like before the crusade starts there. This is a region in the Kingdom of France, but really in name only. The King of France is barely going to play a part of the story until the end. Uh, Languedoc, where the vast majority of the Cathars lived, was a border region. So to the east, there's chaotic mess of Italian city-states and little duchies. Uh, to the south, there's big Spanish kingdoms of Aragon and Castile. Uh, to the west, though still technically in the Kingdom of France, you'll find Aquitaine, which has recently been inherited through marriage by the King of England. So since the idea of borders and nations as we think of them today uh, didn't exist yet, most of those other kingdoms that Patrick uh, just listed owned large chunks of land in the region, and the kings of France uh, had never really been able to do anything without stepping on someone else's toes and causing more trouble than it was worth. The local nobility in the region, therefore, had a ton of power uh, and could get away with doing whatever they wanted. And what they wanted to do was usually to leave the Cathars alone and fight with each other over land claims. Uh, the Count of Toulouse was supposed to be in charge of the whole region. And sometimes over the centuries, they were able to increase their hold over the region and all the little lords beneath them. But, other t but at other times, uh, they were in charge in name only. Uh, the Counts of Toulouse are going to be pretty heavily involved once the Crusade starts. And there's multiple generations of them, and annoyingly enough, they're all named Raymond, uh, with Count Raymond VI and his son Count Raymond VII being the two most important. So this region had gone a long time without any real central authority or any sort of state, so the region ended up being very heavily militarized. Uh, there's little castles all over the place, there's lots of soldiers and knights ready to man those castles, and they're mostly under the command of a very small-scale local nobility who fought for themselves first, and then maybe or maybe not they'd fight for the Count of Toulouse, depending on how they felt. These small-scale nobles were often the closest to the leaders of the Cathar communities who lived in their lands, and just like how joining monastic orders of the Catholic Church was a popular career choice for younger siblings of these families who weren't going to inherit, in Languedoc you start seeing the siblings of these local lords renouncing their possessions and becoming Cathar perfects. And it was not unheard of for these local lords to convert to Catharism themselves, although they wouldn't go so far as to give up their possessions and become perfect. Uh, as you can imagine, becoming a Cathar perfect was also a popular option for sisters, daughters, and mothers of local lords, since it allowed them a lot more independence and influence in their communities than they otherwise would have had. Uh, while these small lords were known to donate money and support to Cathar preachers, they also usually played both sides and would donate to Catholic religious institutions as well. This region also had a few large towns that uh, had been started way back when everything around it was part of the Roman Empire. Narbonne, Toulouse, and Carcassonne uh, were some of the larger ones, and they had churches, some wealth, uh, and some merchants. But this was, in no sense, a major trading hub. They mostly just traded with the surrounding countryside. The towns were controlled by oligarchies, of whichever noble families controlled the land around the town. 
Uh, though these oligarchies sometimes split power in the cities with various Catholic church officials, uh, but more often they didn't. The towns were also home to a very small but growing middle class, and Catharism was especially popular among this class. Now, the Catholic Church did still own a lot of the land in the region, uh, like they did all throughout Catholic Europe at the time, and they had been very active in trying to stop all these little local lords and knights from fighting each other all the time, but it was a tough sell. Uh, so in the history of the region uh, and a lot of Europe leading up to before the Crusade starts, um, there's just constant warfare on a really small scale, and particularly in this region. And if you're imagining the kind of warfare that involves a lot of honor and knights fighting each other nobly, you can get that image right out of your head because the warfare mostly consisted of armored knights from one side just brutally pillaging and slaughtering anyone they could reach, which would mostly be the poor unarmed peasants, and the knights and important people would hide in their castles till they went away. And then once they did, uh, that castle would send out their knights to the next town and uh, do the same thing to them. And um, if you need a pop culture reference for sort of what this looked like, go see the scene in Monty Python on the Holy Grail where Lancelot just murders his way through a peaceful wedding, because that's barely an exaggeration. Uh, officials of the Catholic Church for a long time had to deal with the aftermath of all this violence and were pretty horrified by it. And leading up to the Crusades, there were a lot of attempts by the Catholic Church to impose rules on this kind of warfare to stop Christians from killing Christians as much as possible. But these largely didn't work. Uh, one factor that went into the idea of the crusade ended up being, well, these knights and nobles are constantly murdering our parishioners. We've tried everything. They won't stop it. Maybe if we can't stop them from murdering, we could all just send them someplace far away on a boat so they murder people in other people's communities instead of our own. Um, not that that was the only idea behind the crusade, but that was definitely one of the factors uh, that led to the tradition of crusading being established. Now, the knights and nobles of southern France were initially all for the Crusades, and the Counts of Toulouse uh, went to the Holy Land, and some of them were regarded as model crusaders. The Crusades against the Holy Land uh, definitely reduced the violence in southern France and elsewhere in Europe by exporting that violence into other people's homes. And by the time the 1200s roll around, crusading was already a well-established tradition, and the Toulouse region had been relatively peaceful for a good long stretch of time. But this would end as the violence of the Crusades goes full circle and comes back home, and the knights and nobles of Languedoc would go from fighting in the Crusades to fighting against a Crusade. So while the Cathars and their Catholic neighbors have been getting along pretty well for quite some time, the Pope in Rome and Catholics elsewhere were absolutely horrified by this heresy. Uh, the Cathars had their own priesthood independent of Rome, and of course they believed that the God who created the heaven and earth was sinful, and uh, all those differences, uh, essentially, that we talked about earlier that came to make them view each other as devil worshippers. Um, yeah, here's a quote from 1177. It's a letter to the Pope um, describing the situation in southern France. Um, Formerly venerated ecclesiastical sites lie neglected. They remain in ruins. Baptism is denied, the Eucharist is despised, penance is scarcely performed, the creation of man, the physical resurrection, is utterly re rejected, and all the sacraments of the church are set at naught. And what is dreadful to relate, the two principles are also taught. In 1207, Pope Innocent III sent a papal representative to threaten Count Raymond VI of Toulouse. There had been a lot of earlier attempts to convert the Cathars peacefully, but they all had failed miserably. And the Pope was starting to blame Raymond VI personally for this failure, since he didn't contribute at all to these efforts. Uh, he was accused of sheltering and protecting heretics, uh, which he definitely was, and he was threatened with excommunication from the Catholic Church, which was a pretty big deal. It essentially means uh, you're kicked out of the Christian community. It's one of the big weapons that popes can wield to enforce obedience from Catholic uh, rulers during this time. Essentially, excommunication would entail that uh, you'd be unable to take the Eucharist, and therefore you would forfeit your eventual seat in heaven. The papal representative sent uh, to deal with this diplomatic situation uh, on his way back to Rome from Toulouse ends up getting murdered by a knight, and nobody knows... Uh, who did this and why. Pope Innocent immediately blamed Raymond of Toulouse for ordering the murder and followed through on his threat and excommunicated Raymond immediately, as well as officially declaring uh, what is now known as the Albigensian Crusade. So this was a strange crusade because the area of the fighting was in southern France, uh, making it a much shorter trip for most crusaders than going all the way to the Middle East. So a lot of crusaders jumped on this bandwagon very quickly mostly from northern France. Uh, 
Rather than having to travel across a dozen kingdoms to reach the Holy Land, lords from northern France could assemble an army and march down to fight in a matter of weeks or a month. Uh, thousands of really well-equipped knights, many of them veterans from earlier crusades, started descending on southern France, where they'd been given free range to murder as many heretics as they could get their hands on and seize all the wealth and lands. This was supposed to be a pretty simple, straightforward matter of military might being unleashed against unarmed Cathars, and there's going to be a lot of that coming up. But the knights and small-scale noblemen of southern France all started summoning up their armies and helped defend their lands and the Cathars who lived there. Now again, the Cathars were still a minority, and most of the people who were about to get caught up in this uh, are going to be Catholics on both sides of the conflict. Uh, so here we have a quote that came from a Catholic knight. Uh, when asked by the Catholic Bishop of Toulouse to abandon the heretics he was defending, the knight responded, quote, We cannot. We were brought up with them. There are many of our relatives among them, and we can see their life is a virtuous one, end quote. So at this point, we want to say that the crusade to wipe out the Cathars begins and it involves a great deal of violence and medieval brutality. Um, we feel that going into the details of this are important for the history of the event, and it's sort of our scholastic obligation to not sanitize the story in that way. Nevertheless, for those uh, listeners who don't want to hear about such acts, uh, we would be fine if you just tuned in next episode, but uh, now uh, we're going to begin in full. So the crusade starts rolling south and immediately goes very badly for the Cathars. Uh, the first major engagement of the war is the Siege of Bezerres, uh, which is a first stronghold city that was harboring some Cathars. The crusaders started setting up for a long siege and said that the city would be spared a massacre if they handed over hundreds of heretics to be burned. The people of the city refused, but the city ended up falling quite quickly and chaotically. Uh, right at the start of the fighting, a gate was left open because there's this weird brawl that goes on. It's essentially just some rowdy civilians from the town and some rowdy civilians who are following the Crusader army. And the battle starts out almost like a bar fight. Uh, this partly comes from a problem we're going to see a lot during the Crusades, namely that the Crusaders came pillaging through the countryside and all the peasants would flee to the cities. So when the Siege of Bezerres starts, the city is just brimming with civilian refugees that are causing panic and they're hard to control. Um, it also leads to faster food sort shortages. And it leads to confusing situations like this where some people just open the gate to go out and get into a fist fight. Um, the Crusader Knights and their official army were still setting things up and getting their siege equipment ready, but some of the mercenaries who'd been tagging along uh, spotted this brawl of unarmed Cathar and Catholic servants fighting each other and spotted that the door had been left open, so they just go for it. The city falls to undisciplined mercenaries who had been following the Crusaders, and they start looting and burning and massacring the inhabitants of the city. Uh, the population mostly holds up inside Catholic churches, with both Catholics and Cathars uh, seeking sanctuary and protection from the looting of the city. This does not save them. When a crusader asks a representative of the Pope how they're supposed to know who's a Catholic and who's a heretic, the papal representative says one of the most famous or infamous quotes of the war, which is, kill them all and God will know his own. So one of the first engagements of this war ends with Catholic crusaders mercilessly butchering thousands of mostly Catholic women and children as they prayed for sanctuary in a Catholic church. Here's how that uh, same papal representative describes what happens in his report to the Pope. Indeed, because there is no strength, nor is there cunning against God, while discussions were still going on with the barons about the release of those in the city who were deemed to be Catholics, the servants and other persons of low rank and unarmed attacked the city without waiting for orders from their leaders. To our amazement, crying, to arms, to arms, within the space of two or three hours, they crossed the ditches and walls, and Bezerres was taken. Our men spared no one, irrespective of rank, sex, or age, and put to the sword almost 20,000 people. After this great slaughter, the whole city was despoiled and burnt as divine vengeance miraculously raged against it. Um, and during the looting of the city, the mercenaries had actually um, started fires and started looting at the same time, which led to a lot of the loot being destroyed in fires before the crusaders got into the city. And the Crusaders were pretty uh, mad about this. And so in the next town that fell, um, the Cathar stronghold of Carcassonne, um, the Cathars were spared. They emptied the city out so that the Crusaders could loot it more effectively. Um, but Carcassonne falls uh, also very quickly, surprising everybody, since the Crusaders just managed to get a really good hit with one of their catapults and destroyed the aqueduct that supplied the town with all its water. Um, so the town was sacked, but not wiped out. Um, but after this, a lot of towns and small castles followed the Crusaders. And uh, typically, whenever the Crusaders won, the Cathars were given the choice to convert or die. 
and most Crusader victories ended with them burning a lot of Cathar perfects alive at a mass execution. After the fall of Carcassonne, the Crusading forces finally decided on a leader, and chose Simon of Montfort, a terrifying man who was absolutely perfect for the job. Simon of Montfort was a nobleman from northern France, and he was a hardened veteran of earlier Crusades. He was actually an earl in England, which was one of the top ranks of nobility, and his lands uh, there would have made him a very powerful and wealthy man. His vast English lands were confiscated by the King of England and given to his cousin, leaving him stuck in France where he, was, uh, where he had basically a little bit of backup land. Uh, and this left him with a burning motivation to restore his house to the position of power he had lost, and by successfully leading the crusade, uh, he'd be given rights to rule the conquered lands in the name of the King of France. The other major lords who joined the crusade all thought he was a great compromise candidate, since he was technically an earl, and so he had the he was the social equal uh, to most of the powerful lords in France, which is important because they didn't want their crusade commander, uh, who would be giving them orders, to be of an inferior rank. Uh, at the same time, though, since he was an earl in name only, uh, once he got all the lands of southern France, it wouldn't disrupt the balance of power, since giving that much land to an already established lord uh, would have made them a major threat. Simon was uh, really the archetypal crusader. He was pious, physically strong and imposing, intelligent, ruthless, and utterly without mercy. He was also described again and again in various sources as energetic and tireless. And as we're going to see, he was determined to establish himself as a powerful lord, to break the independence of all the southern lords, and to purge their lands of heresy. So, upon taking command of the crusade, Simon Saxon burns his way through a lot of small towns and villages, using psychological warfare and strategic atrocities to try and break Cathar morale. Um, one example of this was that he took the castle of Brown and captured about 100 uh, Cathar soldiers alive, and he had their eyes, nose, and lips cut off uh, from every soldier except for one who got to keep a single eye uh, so he could lead all the mutilated Cathars back into Cathar territory as an example to anyone else who wanted to fight against the Crusade. The first year was very successful for the Crusaders, but up until this point, Count Raymond of Toulouse had been trying to play nice with the Pope. He was actually publicly flogged as part of his penance and did get his excommunication lifted. Pretty quickly, though, all these massacres and atrocities really started emboldening resistance amongst the southern lords and knights. After getting excommunicated again, Raymond of Toulouse takes up arms and starts fighting against the crusade. So Simon of Montfort brings the crusading forces to the town of Toulouse um, and puts it under siege, and finally the city manages to withstand a crusader siege, and Raymond of Toulouse ends up rallying and chasing the crusading forces back north and putting Simon of Montfort under siege. The fighting generally dies down for a big chunk of every year after this, as everyone doing the fighting also has uh, lives and jobs that they have to go back to for a bit, and they come back next year for the next round of fighting. And this is definitely where the Crusaders find out that the location of the Crusade is a double-edged sword. Crusaders usually take an oath to fight in the Crusade for 40 days at a time. And in a crusade where they have to travel uh, all the way to the Middle East, this wasn't a problem because there was nowhere they could go if they decided to leave the army. Essentially, whoever was commanding the crusade had the implicit promise of the service of these soldiers for uh, as long as need be. If you followed a king off to one of the earlier crusades and your time was up, too bad because unless you stick with the army there's no other way home and probably no one else nearby uh, who even speaks your language. In the crusade against the Cathars, however, uh, once those 40 days were up, people could really just easily walk on back home to their farms and their families, and they uh, did this constantly. So uh, desertion was a major issue, and it was really hard for Simon of Montfort to even keep his army together for any long period of time. Especially with all the sieges where they try and starve people out, it doesn't work if your whole siege army just picks up and leaves uh, for months at a time. So the first year of fighting ends with Crusaders pushed back almost to where they started, and Raymond of Toulouse is still excommunicated, but back on top in terms of the war. So the next year, the Crusade comes roaring back to life and sweeps through the region again, retaking a lot of castles, burning hundreds of more Cathar perfects, and pushing Raymond all the way back to Toulouse again. And that's where things lie at the end of the second year of fighting. In the third year, there's another big reversal. Raymond of Toulouse was married to a princess, Eleanor of Aragon, who was the sister of King Peter II of Aragon. King Peter II was actually crowned personally by Pope Innocent III, who had declared this crusade, and he was actually a really devout defender of the Catholic faith. Uh, he fought on crusades against other people before as a crusader, and his nickname was King Peter the Catholic. Uh, 
Nevertheless, King Peter ends up honoring his alliance to Raymond of Toulouse, and in 1213, he commits his kingdom to the defense of his brother-in-law Raymond's lands. If things had gone different here, this big chunk of southern France could have ended up as part of the Spanish kingdom, since the regions had very close ties already, but that's not what ends up happening. King Peter ends up storming in with his forces against Simon's crusaders, and he breaks the siege of Toulouse, and he drives them back again, and Simon of Montfort again finds himself under siege, this time by mostly Spanish forces. He breaks the siege, however, and finally Simon of Montfort and King Peter the Catholic meet in open battle, uh, and the ba it's the Battle of Berez. So during the open cavalry charge of this battle, King Peter leads by example. He's all decked out in armor, and he's personally leading his best knights in this big, glorious charge. And for just a second, it kind of looks the way we expect medieval battles to look instead of all the horrible, slow, disease-ridden sieges that we've seen so far. So King Peter and his knights slam right into the charging crusader forces, and King Peter is promptly killed in the ensuing fight, which causes his forces to lose morale and scatter, and it basically knocks the entire kingdom right out of the war for good, since their next king does not want to get involved. After this, uh, Simon of Montfort and the Crusaders spend the next few years mopping up the last of the resistance. They finally capture Toulouse, and Montfort is granted the city. And the heir to the throne of France had also started tagging along with the Crusaders at this point. And so the plan was, through Simon of Montfort, to bring this region of France fully under control of the French king in reality as well as in name. Toulouse was sacked and made to tear down their walls to avoid further rebellion. Cathar perfects were burned alive. Count Raymond and his heirs were forced to flee into exile. The king of Aragon was dead, and it, and it looked like the Crusaders had just wrapped up the war. The year after that, though, there came yet another reversal. And this one is definitely uh, one of the most dramatic. In 1216, Count Raymond VI and his adult son, uh, an heir who will eventually be called Raymond VII, both sneak back into Toulouse with Simon of Montfort as away. And the city rejoices to see them, and the Cathars and Catholics of the town rise up in rebellion and seize the city, reinstating Raymond in his seat as Count of Toulouse. The people of Toulouse mobilize very quickly and effectively uh, and start rebuilding their defenses rapidly before Simon of Montfort uh, can come back. And from this point on, there's going to be a series of revolts by the Cathars and their Catholic neighbors to try and toss the occupying crusaders out. Toulouse is brought under siege yet again by Simon of Montfort, who has been fighting and massacring Cathars for about four years at this point, rather than uh, the one campaign season the Crusaders initially expected. So there's Simon, after his moment of triumph. Uh, he's had his perfect victory, but now the city that was supposed to be his big prize has been denied him completely and revolted, leaving him fuming, stuck on campaign, again in this filthy siege camp, trying to retake it. The heretics of Toulouse were all up in arms, and the whole city was working together to defend them. After nine months of siege, during yet another attack on the city, on the 25th of June, 1217, Simon of Montfort gets straight up crushed to death by a giant rock launched by the women and girls of Toulouse who had joined the men in fighting and were manning the catapults and trebuchets. Now Simon is out of the picture, and one of his older sons briefly tries to assume command. But essentially the Montforts are out of the war from that point on, and the leaderless crusader forces just sort of flail about for a while after that. As a side note, one of the younger sons of Simon of Montfort, who uh, coincidentally is also named Simon of Montfort, does manage to regain all the lands and titles the family had lost back in England, uh, and he eventually becomes an enormously important figure in English history, uh, where he's been known as the Father of Parliament, although that's a different story. With Raymond finally back in control of Toulouse, the whole war starts right back up, with local nobility and Cathar communities who had surrendered earlier joining this new revolt from all over the region. Raymond VI will eventually die of natural causes a few years after retaking his city, but still being excommunicated, was not allowed to be buried in the Catholic churchyard, so his body is just left to rot in the courtyard. His son Raymond VII then took command of the resistance, and the war actually ended up dragging on for over 20 years. After the death of Simon of Montfort, the King of France finally started getting more directly involved in sending forces down, and the crusade went back and forth for over two decades of just sieges, mass burnings of Cathars who refused to convert, and other atrocities leading to further revolts until at last Raymond VII is defeated once and for all by the French king in battle, and Raymond marries his daughter to the King of France's brother, and unfortunately after this, the last protection of the Cathars was gone. This crusade had gone on for so long, there were so many burnings and other atrocities that the region was pretty thoroughly devastated, and many Cathar communities simply did not survive the numerous massacres intended to wipe them out. 
After Raymond VII made peace with the King of France, the Catholic Church was able to set up an inquisition in the area, and surviving Cathars were hunted down, tortured, and burned wherever they could be found for the next 100 years until they were completely wiped out. The Albigensian Crusade is considered by most scholars to be an example of a genocide that was successfully carried out with hundreds of thousands of Cathars brutally murdered, and some estimates putting the number near a million dead. The unique culture of the region was dealt a severe blow, and what had been a centuries-long tradition of local independence for the small lords was gone forever. There's very little left of Catharism today, and there are no practicing communities that have survived, other than people who live in southern France today and weirdo historians and scholars like us who study this sort of thing, uh, not a lot of people are aware that the Cathars ever even existed. A Roman Catholic bishop from the region did eventually issue a formal apology for a specific incident where 200 Cathar perfects were burned, saying, quote, We ask the Lord for forgiveness for some of our members and some of our institutions, participating in acts contrary to the gospel, in which the Lord Jesus gave us the commandment to love our neighbor, and not to respond to violence with violence, end quote. This first, and so far only official apology, was issued on October 16th, 2016. Well, thank you for joining us for this grim history of Catharism. Uh, you can join us on our next episode as we shake things up with a history of the Shakers. Uh, but for Sex Ed, I'm Michael Albaney. And I'm Patrick Reynolds, and uh, I'd like to give a shout-out, uh, thank you, to Kristen Pagels, who helped me with some of the French, French pronunciations, uh, even though I probably butchered them anyway. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albaney and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is created under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at Leader the Lab for the Education and Advancement in Digital Research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.